The tide pools of Australia are full of bizarre, mysterious creatures, but we need to be careful. I just got drilled. Some of the creatures that call this environment home can also be deadly. An eel! Wow, do you see that? It's trying to bite its reflection. What's going on, Brave Crew? We're back in Queensland, Australia, about to head off for another epic tide pool adventure. And we absolutely love these tide pools because they're jam-packed with super unique creatures, including some of the most deadly on Earth. So if you're ready, it looks like the tide's headed out, which means it's time for us to get our feet wet and try to find something we've never seen before. Okay, let's go. So you'll notice that all of the surface of the rocks right now is wet and slippery. We wanna move extremely slow. The last thing we want is for someone to take a nasty spill because we're moving too fast. Looks like there might be some more pockets ahead. Let's head up a little bit further this way and make moves toward the point. Hey guys, I think I got a crab here. Got him, ha ha. This is a swift-footed shore crab, and they are very difficult to catch because, like their name, they're very swift. Now, these crabs are very, very common in these tide pools. In fact, we were here last year, and I caught one and took a photograph and put it on Instagram, and it was one of my most liked Instagram posts of our entire production last year, but unfortunately, we could not catch one again to get it on camera, so I'm really happy that I was able to find one today to show you guys. This one does feel like it did just molt, which is perhaps why it was a little easier to catch and maybe a little bit slower. I can tell that because its shell is slightly soft. But what's really cool about crabs is they're sort of like the custodians of the tide pools. They're like the cleanup crew. They're opportunistic omnivores. So they're out here eating a lot of the dead things and all the carrion. And they also eat some of the plant life, including some of the algae and some of the plankton scum that washes up. So they do a very good job at managing these tide pools and keeping them pristine for all the other creatures. So thank you for doing that. And we're gonna let you go now so you can go about your day. See you, buddy. Thanks for hanging out. There he goes. Oh, look at this. This tide pool is brimming with life. It's a lot of fish. A lot of fish around here. Wait a second. That is a cone snail. And cone snails are very venomous. So what I wanna do real quick is I'm going to place the cone snail on this glove. This is actually sting proof and bite proof to use when you handle venomous creatures. All right, there you have it. You can see that patterning on the shell and that's how I was able to identify it as a cone snail. Some might say this is actually an aposomatic coloration because of how venomous this creature is. You can actually see its foot reaching out to right itself right now. That's pretty cool. All right, so let's talk about what makes a cone snail such a lethal predator. They're actually armed with a very specialized radular tooth up by their mouth. They can actually shoot a venomous barb out like a harpoon to dispatch their prey. Now this barb is laced with a neurotoxic venom, so it, it immediately paralyzes the prey, so then the snail can catch up and consume it. Because some of them actually eat fish, and those cone snails are actually very dangerous to human beings. So if you're ever gonna come out shelling or pick up a snail in this region of the world, you definitely wanna be aware of what a cone snail looks like before you do so. All right, let's put it back and see what else we can find out here in the tide pools. Well, I have good news and bad news. The good news is we've already found some pretty cool animals. The bad news is the weather that's been pushing through the last few days is really not letting this tide drop quite as low as I thought it would. So I have a GoPro wearable that I'm gonna throw on my shoulder and I'm gonna head out there with this net, get in those rocks and hope to get lucky. Whoa, I'm glad I moved that mic pack. Nothing around here, I'm gonna move through this way. Getting a little precarious, oh boy. I'm really glad the bike pack's on this side and not that side, because I just got drilled. The storm surge is for real. Okay, let's make a way around here. Getting soaked. Nothing. Seen a bunch of fish darting in and out. Hold on. What's that? There's something right there. An eel! 
Oh my goodness. Check this out. Wow. Look at that. Okay, I can't keep it out of water for too long. We gotta go find a spot to do the presentation. Let's go over here to this pocket. Wow. I think what I wanna do to present this eel because I can't really handle it out of the water, I'm gonna put it in one of our cubes. Here, uh, can somebody hold that eel in the water there, just like that? Okay, cool. Let me get my pack off. Let's uh, fill this up with water. Okay, this is a delicate little maneuver. Now, got this real quick. Okay, got it. Perfect. Yes. First things first, let's talk about the type of eel that we found here. This is a snowflake eel. It's called a snowflake eel because as you can see on its side through the center line, it has all these beautiful patterns in the shape of snowflakes. Now, an eel is actually a fish, not a snake. A lot of people confuse these animals with snakes, with sea snakes, and they are not venomous like a sea snake at all. Although they do have razor sharp teeth. In fact, they have two rows of teeth on the top, one row of teeth on the bottom, and then get this, inside their throat, they actually have another set of jaws called the pharyngeal jaws, which is an inner jaw structure that it uses to actually munch on its meals and draw in food as it has the rest of the prey item clasp in those front teeth, which is pretty creepy if you think about it, but a highly adapted mechanism that has allowed these eels to thrive in ecosystems like these tide pools in Australia. Wow, do you see that? It's trying to bite its reflection. Now eels in particular are actually Fairly aggressive animals are actually one of the animals we have to worry the most about when we're out there diving. They don't really back down. They're very courageous creatures and they're not really afraid of human beings. And they have been known to attack divers at times when you get too close. So whenever we see eels underwater, we always wanna keep our safe distance from them. But in a unique situation like this, I'm able to take an eel and put it in a container and get it right up close to the camera. That is so amazing. Now, eels, have extremely poor eyesight. Even though it has very beautiful eyes, those bright yellow eyes on each side of its head, uh, they really can't see very well, so they rely heavily on their sense of smell. Their sense of smell is incredible. In fact, if we get a tight enough shot, you can see it has these little yellow appendages coming out of its nostrils, and it can use those to direct its sense of smell. So it's a pretty cool little adaptation that it has. And these animals, like most mores, can filter water by opening and closing their mouths and then dragging the water across their gills for respiration. Well, I say that caps off an excellent adventure today. We came back out to Australia's tide pools to find something we've never found before, and lo and behold, we find our very first eel. Man, this is awesome. Right now, we are searching these tide pools off the coast of Eastern Australia for the most toxic fish on the planet. The stonefish is notorious for having the most painful sting in all of nature. And today, I'm going to get stung by a stonefish. But first, we've got to find one. Let's get looking. It's going to be very hard to find the stonefish because in addition to their legendary sting, they are masters of hiding. The key to this is going to be to move slow, methodically, and to not step on the stonefish. You could be looking right at a stonefish and not even realize it. And that's why so many people step on them by accident. But stonefish, are all we have to look out for. This isn't the only animal that could do you harm here in the tide pools off of Australia. We also have cone snails and the blue ring octopus, one of the most lethal creatures in the world. And not only is it risky just being out here, but we also have to beat the clock. The tide is coming in fast, and this whole area is about to be completely underwater. So if we want to catch a stonefish, we need to do that before it happens. Everything looks exactly the same. This is gonna to be tough. Oh, right there. You see it moving? That is the stonefish. And I never would have seen that fish if it didn't give itself away by moving. Holy smokes. Now these fish are so toxic, they don't really have a flight response. I'm gonna to attempt to catch the most toxic fish in the world with my bare hands. All right, here we go. Wow, there it is. That is the stonefish. Look at that tide pool monster. I can't believe we found one. 
I mean, it looks like a living rock. I never would have spotted this fish if it didn't move. The fact that it swam a little bit there is the only reason I was able to catch this fish. And you can see how docile this fish is. It knows just how toxic it can be. Wow. But the table is set for what will be likely the worst sting I ever take. Placing the stonefish in the tank hit my nerves hard. I'm about to get stung by a stonefish. Stonefish stings are said to be one of the most painful experiences a human can endure. And I've already experienced my fair share of fish stings. One from the most common fish sting, which is the lionfish. Ah, oh! And the other from the scorpionfish, which is the most toxic fish sting in North America. Oh, yeah, he got me. Oh. Each sting was painful, but I was certainly able to tough it out with basic treatment. However, each of those fish fall far short of the danger from the stonefish. Not every day you get to carry around the world's most toxic fish in a tank. This fish might just have the worst sting in the entire animal kingdom. Man, my nerves are firing right now. Just looking at this fish is so incredibly cool. Look at all the growths all over its body definitely earns its name, the stonefish, a master of camouflage. All right, let's go hands-on once again with the stonefish. The reason I can handle this fish is because it can only sting from the spines on top. Wow. This fish has developed the most potent fish toxin in the world. The toxin is only to defend itself. Unfortunately, as you can see, it is so docile that it's very easy for people to step on these fish. And that is the most common way people are stung by the stonefish. The toxin of this fish not only induces extraordinary pain, it can actually cause muscle spasms and eventual paralysis. And there have even been reported deaths from stonefish stings. But now I think it's time to see how this fish injects its venom. I'm going to just pour out this water. I'm gonna use this little tank here as a platform. This fish is perfectly fine being out of the water for extended periods of time because they've adapted the ability to actually hold water in their gills. It's not uncommon to see stonefish just laying on the rocks in these tide pools. So in the little bit of time that we have it here in front of the cameras, totally fine. All right, so I brought with me a piece of neoprene. I'm going to use this piece of neoprene to simulate skin so I can show you what would happen if you stepped on the stonefish. This animal has the ability to fire its venom into the wound created by its spine. That's why people who are envenomated and step on these stonefish end up in such a bad situation. It's not only that it's the most toxic venom, it's that you also get the most volume. Look at how sharp that spine is. Okay, in order to do this properly, I do need to get out some eye protection, so I'm gonna do that quickly. This venom, it has enough toxin in it to cause vision problems and perhaps even blindness. All right, let's see in slow motion how these spines inject venom. I'll do these top two, you guys ready? Here they go. One, two, three. Oh, wow. Look at that. And it's like blue. Holy cow, look at how much venom just came out of that fish. And let's do another one, do it one more time. Oh my gosh, guys, the spines are blue. And once those spines are out, they stay out. And they're ready to defend. All right, let me try these uh, spines on the back here. One, two, three. Wow, that is what would be inside of your foot if you were to step on a stonefish. Now, it will regenerate its venom. This doesn't hurt the fish at all. And you can see these sheaths will just slide right back up. But holy cow, I gotta take a minute and process what I just saw. Oh, that is bad. I won't lie, I'm getting pretty nervous right now. This is something you should never do. I've consulted experts, people who have been stung. I've done my research, I've done my homework, but even still, I am extremely nervous about what is about to happen. It's said that this is the most painful sting in the world. <sighs> Wish me luck. The moment has come. It's time to be stung by the world's most toxic fish. I am borderline terrified. 
I've thought long and hard about whether or not to even go through with this, but I'm doing this today because through my research on the stonefish, I have found a lot of misinformation out there. There is a lot of stories that pretty much describes certain death if you're stung by a stonefish, and that's just simply not the case. While this toxin in the base of its spines is extremely potent, it is thermal liable. So if treated properly and if needed with medical attention, you will survive the sting of a stonefish. Most of the victims that end up dying from stonefish stings, but has more to do with the pain and shock that leads to cardiac arrest. This venom is meant to cause you pain, but I have brought the antidote with me today. A thermos filled with hot water that's around 114 degrees Fahrenheit, a compress to hold over the wound, and then of course, if I do go into any state of anaphylactic shock, I always carry with me an EpiPen. We are about three minutes drive from an emergency room. So even if the worst case scenario does unfold today, I should have plenty of time to be able to get to emergency medical attention. All right, my plan today is to take a micro dose of stonefish venom. The venom from that neoprene trial is already coating the spikes. So they are locked and loaded, ready to go. When it's all said and done, this should be just extraordinarily painful for me and hopefully very educational for you. This is going to likely be the worst sting that I ever take. I'm Mark Vins and I'm about to enter the sting zone with the stonefish, the most toxic fish in the world. All right, I'm gonna go with this front spine here. Ready? This spine on three, one, two, three. Mmm. Yep. Mmm. I already feel burn. I could feel it spreading up my finger right now. And it does not feel good. Wow, the tide is coming in. All right, here, let's. Mmm. Hang on. Mm, let's move out of here. The tide's rolling in. You okay, Mark? Yeah, hang on. I'm gonna come over here. Andrew, put the fish back in the tank, man. Mm. Oh. Right there is where, where the spine went in. God, immediate fire spreading up my fingers. I can already feel it in these, these three. Mmm. Okay? No, I'm okay. I'm okay right now. It's like a different magnitude of pain. It is like throbby, achy. Mm. Hang on, I gotta walk it off. Yeah. I'm gonna try to tough it out for a little bit. I wanna see how far the venom spreads before I start applying the first aid. This is borderline unbearable. Mm. Oh my gosh. Mm. Let me know when you need the water, Mark. I'm just like, it's making me nervous. Mm. Oh my gosh. Yeah, definitely drew a little bit of blood. Oh, and it is hot. It's like closing my hand is becoming hard. Mm. Uh, yeah, it's spreading. It's like all up the back of my hand now. I think I need to go for the hot water, guys. I don't want this to spread anymore. I'm going to hot water. There we go. Stonefish is good. Now I need to fix myself. So this hot water will actually stop the venom from working and should help my pain. Mmm. Every bit as painful as advertised. I never want to do that again. And I need to get more hot water on this sting. And hopefully the pain subsides, but it's still increasing for me. Tingling pain continued to build and spread up through my shoulder all the way to my neck. Even a month after the sting, I still have numbness and tingles in my fingers. The immediate pain wasn't enough to send me to the hospital, but as we released the stonefish, I could imagine what would happen if a full load of its venom were to go on my foot. That instance would send you directly to the hospital. And if you're ever stung, please, you should seek medical attention as soon as possible. Needless to say, the stonefish certainly lives up to the legend of being the most painful fish on the planet. Oh man, I am super excited 
The creature that we're looking for tonight is probably one of the most bizarre animals that could be found in Australia. And we have featured some interesting things over the years on Brave Wilderness, but I can promise you nothing compares to the turtle frog. We needed rain to find this frog and the rains have come. You are not going to miss this. Finding a turtle frog is almost impossible because you have to be in the small remote desert they live in Western Australia while it's raining. And this only happens a few times a year. Yes! Yes! Next to no footage exists of this species. If we find one, this will be the very first high quality footage ever seen. Oh, stop the car. I see something on the road. First animal of the night, a really cool lizard. Oh my gosh, it's got a huge tick on him though. I'm gonna try to pull this off. Look at that, you got a tick. Oh my gosh. You see that? That is a big tick. And that is a really cool lizard. Very good sign for our search tonight. We're not exactly looking for shinglebacks, but this one was crossing the road, so we wanted to move him out of the way. You're welcome. All right, let's let you go off the road so you can continue on your way and we'll continue on ours. This rain has the animals on the move. Like all amphibians, turtle frogs need moisture to survive and to breed. That is why they come up to the surface after it rains. Without this rain, the frogs will remain buried beneath the ground and impossible to find. To make matters worse, turtle frogs only come to the surface at night. We're going to have to look and listen closely to even have a small chance at spotting one. All my life, I've been a frog nerd, and I've been able to track down iconic species like the red-eyed tree frogs and poison dart frogs of Central America. And I've also gotten hands-on with all different kinds of toads, from giants, oh, wow, to the most colorful, got it, like this extremely rare harlequin toad. However, the turtle frog has always been my grail animal, and tonight is the first time in my career I'll have a shot at catching one. But if we're going to do that, I'll have to rely on all my years of experience and animal catching tricks to track one down. Perfect habitat for the turtle frog. See that right there? That sand substrate. The turtle frog, it burrows down up to three feet below the surface, so it really needs the sand to be able to do that. Okay, let's keep looking. We're definitely on the trail now. It's really a miracle in itself that we got prime turtle frog conditions tonight. Like seriously, all week long, the forecast called for clear skies and no rain. But tonight, out of nowhere, the rain rolled in. And I have to say, it's making this adventure feel like destiny. Oh, guys, I got something. All right, so what you're looking at there is a spiny tail gecko named for the spines on the tail, which are actually just modified scales. And they're soft, they're not sharp at all. Now these geckos have a pretty unique defense mechanism where they're able to actually secrete a chemical mixture from their tails. They like whip it at the predators trying to eat them and it doesn't taste very good. The eyes of a gecko are probably some of the coolest eyes on the planet. They actually don't have eyelids, so they have to lick their eyeballs to keep them moist. Can you imagine that, licking your own eyeball? Sure glad we have eyelids. Love these geckos. Okay, we're gonna let this gecko go back in the bush and keep looking. Well, that's a good sign. We're continuing to see new creatures. Guys, guys, I got one. Look at this frog. Holy cow, that is cool. Wow. We found our first amphibian of the night. It's not the frog we're after, but that is a great sign that means that we're getting enough rain for the amphibians out here to come out of the soil. This is the Western Spotted Frog, and just like turtle frogs, they only come out just after a rainstorm. This is not the frog we're after, but it's a good start. Let's let this one go and keep searching. Perfect conditions. We just gotta keep looking. Got the rain, we're in the right spot. I've already seen one species of frog. This is like, the sweet spot, this is what we need. Got everything except the turtle frog itself. After hours of searching, we weren't seeing any signs of turtle frogs. Luckily, my experience has taught me sometimes the best way to find the frog you're looking for is with your ears. Did you guys hear that? I think I heard one. Yep. 
You guys hear that? Hold on, one more. Let's see if we can hear it one more time. If we hear it again, we'll try to find it. I think that's one, guys. Let's try to canvas this area in front of us here. Stop calling. We must be right next to him. Got him. Got a turtle frog. Holy mother. Oh my God. Look, there he is. There it is. I cannot believe we found the frog. Oh my. <laughs> oh my goodness. Hello. Come here, buddy. Oh my gosh. We have come so far to find this species. There is the turtle frog. Yeah, baby! Woo! <laughs> what are the freaking odds? Guys. Oh my gosh! I cannot believe we got one. Oh. Hello. Have you ever seen anything like that in your life? This is one of the coolest creatures I have ever laid my eyes on. Let's just appreciate this super unique creature. What you're looking at is some of the first HD footage ever recorded of a turtle frog. I mean, this species is so rare, there's very little information to find about them. But here's what we do know about this bizarre little frog. Let's start with the name, turtle frog. Named for its appearance, the most unusual frog I have ever seen, but look at its head. That dome-shaped head with the black beady little eyes and then the circular body. Looks like a turtle without a shell. This is one of the most unique looking frogs you will ever see. It looks like something out of Star Wars. Jabba the Hutt's relative. Some people say it looks like a, a little wad of chewing gum and it certainly looked like that when we first saw it. I have wanted to film. I have wanted to find one of these frogs for my entire career. This is a, a big, big moment for me. You can't sense my excitement after this. This is about as big as it gets for a frog nerd like me. Hi, buddy. Look at that pudge. Are you kidding me? Has to be one of the most unique looking frogs, but probably the cutest frogs as well. Super pudgy, super soft. Feels like a, a water balloon almost. And when it's walking across my hand, you can really tell how much liquid is in the frog. It's like a, a deflated water balloon, but it is a very delicate frog, but it's somewhat stout. It's got a lot of power in those legs. I can feel it when it's crawling across my hand. It uses its stocky arms and legs to burrow into the soil. It really is incredible how something so small and soft can dig over three feet underground. And actually here, let me get out. I'm gonna take my pack off and uh, get out a little bit of water because I don't want to dry out the frog. One of the things you always want to make sure you do when handling any amphibian is make sure you don't dry them out and this water will, will help. Oh, hey, came to life there. Hey, buddy, it's all right. Oh my goodness. Endemic to Western Australia. It can only be found here, but that's not where the oddities end. In fact, the oddities begin with this species when it's born. It's one of the few species of frogs on the planet that does not have a tadpole stage. This frog begins its life with a full set of hands and legs. What's also unique about this species is that they have one of the largest eggs of all frogs in Australia. In fact, five centimeters is as big as they grow, and this frog is approaching maximum length. Now, there's a certain period of year where at the tail end of it uh, that it's breeding and it will actually call. That's how we were able to find this frog. And it was definitely a team effort. We've got Max with us here. Uh, from Australia Wildlife Encounters. Max and I were 
slowly honing in on this little frog. And then I crouched down and there it was, just like you saw it right there <laughs> underneath the bush, looking right back at us with those beady little eyes. And it was so unlikely for us to find this frog, guys. The rains were not supposed to come. And sure enough, they appear today, almost like out of thin air, a front came in, provided enough moisture for us to have a chance to put this frog in front of the cameras. And I am so excited you guys get to see it. Now, we think this is a male because of the way it was calling. And when they're mating, they have an extended honeymoon. Once a turtle frog locates its mate, they will both burrow together for months before actually breeding and depositing their eggs. This is a, a very unique species, guys. There's not a ton of information and very few studies of this frog. So when it comes to filming animal oddities, it doesn't really get any better than this. And I am just over the moon right now that we were able to come out here our first time in Western Australia, our first time in turtle frog territory against the odds. And sure enough, we were able to find one. Oh man, I am so excited. We got to show you guys the turtle frog. What a cool frog this is. Guys, are you kidding me? Tell me in the comments section if you've seen a cooler frog than the turtle frog. I challenge anyone out there to name a more unique species of amphibian because I do not know of one. All right, let's go put this frog back and head in for the night. Man, that was awesome. We are in the outback of Western Australia looking for a truly bizarre creature and it's covered in razor sharp spines. Let's just say catching this one, it's gonna hurt a little. This creature is just as shy as it is sharp. So first we have to track one down in this huge forest, which also happens to be home to another one of the rarest and most endangered animals on the planet that we're also trying to find by the end of this video. But in order to catch this giant spike ball, we're going to need to look for clues. Oh yeah, right there, check that out. This is a termite nest. This will be a perfect feast for the creature that we're after today. That tells me we are on the right track. Let's keep searching. Our second clue is that these creatures love to hide near trees and stumps. So that's where we're spending the most time looking. The problem is this forest is full of hiding places. This is like looking for a needle or a big pile of needles in a giant haystack. After hours of searching, we got lucky with the discovery of a final clue. That is a good sign right there. That's some poop from the creature we're after. You can see all the ants and termites in here. That means we're getting close. Oh, right there. That's an echidna. Look at that. Oh, ho, ho. yes. That is what we have been looking for all morning long. That is Australia's spikiest creature, the echidna. And it is, yeah, wow, that is sharp. Okay, the echidna from the top is a tank riddled with spikes and a super tough skin. But underneath the echidna is a soft belly. And I'm gonna try to work my hand underneath this animal so I can present it to you. This is probably going to be a challenge. Let's see if I get my hand underneath. Ready? Ah, come here, buddy. It's okay and he's just wriggling in there. Ah, oh, he's spiking, ah, he's getting me. Mm. Now, unlike a porcupine, their spines can't release, but they are super sharp nonetheless. Ow, okay, okay, he's really wedged in there, guys. This is gonna be tough. Ah, mm. yeah, I'm getting nailed. All right, I'm gonna have to use some gloves here. There's no way I'm gonna be able to pry out this echidna. It is basically cuffing up its body, using its spikes to wedge itself into this stump of the tree. All right, here we go. Luckily, I always carry a good pair of gloves with me on every adventure. I wanna get to the underside of the echidna that is much softer, and that should allow me to hold it for the scene. But I'm gonna have to do this really carefully. I'm trying to like work under all of the different spines. There we go. Uh-huh. Okay. Now, these spines are nothing more than modified hair, so this isn't hurting the echidna at all. It's only hurting me. Ah! Oh, you're sharp. Ow! Poked right through the club. Okay. okay. I've got the underside. I've got the underside. This is good. Okay. I think I feel his foot. Ow! Oh, gosh, you are really... Ah! Get spined so bad. 
Okay. All right, I'm underneath him. I'm underneath him. This is good. Run the underbelly is much easier to contend with. All right, right. Got him. Got him. I've got the echidna. We got one, guys. That is the echidna. Hello. All right, let's go this way. I see an opening over here. This will be perfect. So I think for the echidna to be most comfortable, it's going to mean a little discomfort for me. I'm going to attempt to take my gloves off to do this scene, not only in hopes that the echidna will be more comfortable and will show us that beak, but also as to show everyone why you should never pick up an echidna. Oh boy. Hello. <laughs> this animal likes to hide by wedging against the nearest object. In this case, it's my foot. Gotta get to the soft belly part. <laughs> oh, you're so sharp. Come back in here. Come here. Every time I try to pick him up, his spikes break under the skin of my fingernails. Come on, come on, come on, Knuckles. Anybody who is a fan of the Sonic the Hedgehog video game definitely knows Knuckles the Echidna. You are tough as nails, Knuckles. Yeah. Hey, buddy, I'm gonna put you on my knee, if that's okay. It's going through my pants. Ah, ah, Knuckles. Oh my gosh, it's so sharp. Okay, hi. You are the spikiest creature I have ever held with my bare hands. Oh my goodness. Okay, this animal from the top side is almost bulletproof from any predator. Not only does it have these sharp spines, but the top hide is very tough. Now on the underside of the echidna, <laughs> on the underside of the echidna, there's very soft underbelly along with its face. Hopefully this echidna will get comfortable enough with me today to show its little face because it is super adorable. I am trying to make it as comfortable as I can. <laughs> As discomforting as it is for me, I want to show you that adorable little beak. The face of the echidna. Come on, buddy. I'm just going to hold it here and try to be silent. And try to be silent! Oh my gosh. Oh, he's poking his nose at me. Come on. Come on, say hi. Oh, I think we're going to have an appearance of the echidna beak. Hi. Hello. Come say hi. Oh, I can see the eyeball. Come say hi. Ah! No, 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 that's a no. Door slammed. There we go. Give it a shot. Show us your cute little mug. <sighs> Try to be quiet. Fight through the pain. Because I want you to see the face of the echidna. Come out, come out and show us. Show us the face. Here it comes. Here it comes. Here it comes. Can you see it? Oh, mm. Mm. oh there's a snail. Mm. Mm. Guys, get the shot. Get the shot. Hi. Hi. How are you? I'm not doing good. I hope you're doing well, though. All right, guys. That is the beak of the echidna. And it has been very painful to get on camera. Ah, you little, you little, you little spike ball. Ah. Okay, okay. So you can see the boogery nose there. These animals just recently were discovered to be able to regulate their body heat by blowing snot bubbles on their nose. Oh man. Okay. <sighs> Just gotta work through the pain a little bit. So an echidna feasts on a diet made up completely of ants and termites. In fact, this animal also has some of the best hearing of any animal in Australia. And it's so sophisticated, they can actually hear the termites and the ants crawling underground, which is why we have to be so quiet. <laughs> so sharp. It is so sharp. And now, compared to the hedgehog, an echidna weighs a lot more. I would say this echidna is in excess of 10 pounds. And just the weight alone, oh, makes it super sharp in its spines. Ah, 
fucking spines are so sharp, guys. Okay. Ah. Ah. Now, if you get a shot of that foot, you'll notice that it's actually backwards. That is a very unusual trait. A lot of times when people are tracking echidnas, they will actually follow them the opposite direction because of the fact that those hind feet are flipped in the opposite direction. These animals have long claws on the back of their feet that are primed for digging, and the echidna has the ability to dig in. And a lot of times when you see these in the environment, they are literally just a ball of spikes. In fact, the only predator that really targets the echidna here in Australia is the feral invasive fox. They'll actually pee on the back of these animals and get them to flip over to expose that soft underbelly. From the top, the echidna is almost bulletproof. From underneath, they're a little teddy bear. And that's why it curls up into a ball, just like this. All right. Look at that face. Ow, you hurt me. You hurt me so. Ugh. Okay, okay, put him down, put him down. Ah, ah, ah. Definitely drew some blood. That is like wildlife acupuncture. I do not recommend it. It's time to put our echidna back where we found it. And honestly, I'm not sure who's happier about this. Me or the echidna. My hands are on fire right now. Ouch. With the echidna safely back in its tree and my hands throbbing in pain, it's now time to track down one of the rarest animals on the planet, the numbat one of the last living relatives of the now extinct Tasmanian tiger. Most of the remaining numbats in the world live in Dryandra National Park, but Dryandra is completely surrounded by farmland, trapping the numbats inside. This forest is really the last place we can find them. Spotting one is going to be really challenging because they blend into the landscape perfectly. Luckily, just like the echidna, numbats feed on termites, so we know we're on the right trail. We searched the forest really hard for over six hours without a sign of anything. It was a ghost town, but just when I was thinking about giving up for the day, I noticed something furry running through the bushes. Oh my gosh, that's him. Oh my God. There he is. I found one. I got him. I'm filming a numbat. He's looking right at me. Oh, I can't believe it. Wow, this is one of the last numbats on the planet. Numbats are a critically endangered species with less than 1,000 left in the wild. Places like Dryandra National Park in Australia are so important in protecting species like this from going extinct. And that's why it's important that this forest remains standing. This has to be one of the rarest animals I've ever filmed. What's he, what's he doing now? What's he doing? No. Is he trying to crawl inside? No way. Never gonna fit. Ha! Huh. Look at his little legs go. He can barely fit. Is he gonna make it? Oh, oh, <laughs> and there he goes. I'm Mark Vins, and I'm about to take a sting from the most aggressive ant on the planet. This nest here in front of me is home to the Australian bulldog ant that can both bite and sting. And I'm about to find out just how much damage it can do. I'm going to attempt to use this little stick to try to get a bulldog ant for our sting test. All right, got our forceps, small container. Now we just need the bulldog ant itself. I'm going to lightly disturb the entryway. Oh, here we go, got him already. That makes me nervous. The ants are starting to swarm. You see how big they are? This is like, a volcano of ants. Oh gosh, almost got me. They're getting on me. All right, I'm gonna have to get our ant fast. Here we go. I got it. Yes. Oh man. Oh. There we go. We've got one. That is a really good sized bulldog ant. Starting to swarm a little too much to hang out here. Let's go reposition away from the nest so we can get a closer look at one of the scariest ants in the world. Australians fear these massive ants because they attack in swarms and without warning. If you accidentally disturb them, you can be covered in just a matter of seconds. Bulldog ants can be found all over Australia and often build nests in people's yards and local parks, which is exactly where we discovered these ants. 
This particular species is one of the largest, growing to over one inch in length. And of course, for this sting test, we wanted the big dogs, so we could compare how they rank against the legendary bullet ants of South and Central America. Now it's time to find out which is worse. <sighs> All right, guys, it is officially go time with the bulldog ant. Look at the size of this insect. Size-wise, I would definitely say it gives the bullet ant a run for its money, but appearance? This ant is second to none when it comes to intimidation factor. But before I test the might of this insect, let's get it out of the container and take an even closer look at those jaws and its stinger. All right, here we go. Oh, it's already jumping out. I wanna be very careful right now. And they are so aggressive. Look at that, it's already biting on the forceps. I'm just gonna try my best to get a good grip. And I'm getting nervous, gosh, hang on. All right, I gotta get it on the ground. Here we go. Unlike other ants, they don't really react to scents and pheromones, they react to sight. So anytime I try to grab it with the forceps, it sees that I'm coming. There we go. Okay, perfect hold. There it is. No animal has been requested for a sting test more than the bulldog ant in the history of Brave Wilderness. And now I can see why. Wow, I have never seen a more terrifying looking ant in my entire life. Let's start at the top. Look at the size of those mandibles. They are like serrated shears attached to these bulbous eyes, almost like a vice grip, just ready to snap and pinch on to anything it can touch. Look at the eyes of the ant. You can really see how much it reacts by using its sight. Look how it turns its head to the different ways that I position my finger around it. And then, of course, before we get to the stinger, I just have to say, look at the size of those legs because they are visually stimulated. They use their extremely long legs to extend quickly and flick themselves onto any would-be predator, earning them the name jumping jacks. And then of course, we can see the stinger flying already from the abdomen. Like other stinging insects, only the females can sting. This is actually a century or a soldier ant tasked with guarding the front of the nest. And you saw with just the slightest disruption, a fleet of soldiers came flying out of the nest, ready for attack. They got all over my boots and nearly took a sting right away, but we saved the sting for this moment in the video. The sting of this ant is said to be one of the most painful experiences that you can get from any animal here on the continent of Australia. Some even argue in the world. The biggest difference between bullet and bulldog ant stings are the toxins they use. Bullet ants use a Panera toxin, which is slow building and can last for days, where bulldog ants use formic acid that causes instant pain. And when these ants swarm and cover people by the dozens, they have the ability to take down a fully grown adult. Holy cow, she's looking at me. Oh my gosh, look at that stinger go. I have a feeling this is going to hurt. I'm Mark Vins and I'm about to enter the sting zone with one of the most terrifying ants on the planet, the Australian Bulldog Ant. On three, one, two, three. Ah, yeah, ah, oh my God, you see the stinger going in? Yeah, that's a good sting. Ah. Oh. Yeah. Oh. Ah, it's really got its stinger in me. Ah, look at it, stingers in. Ah. Ah. Mm. 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 Ah. All right, put it back in the jar. Oh, that hurts. All right. Ah. Oh my gosh! Woo! Oh, oh my goodness! Yeah, that burns. That is a super, super intense sting. Oh my gosh. Okay, hang on. Let me compose myself. Oh, oh man. That was like instant fire underneath my skin so much more like potent than the bullet ant. But I can tell you this, the bite was really nothing. Didn't really get a good grip on with those jaws, but it certainly got its stinger stuck in my arm. And it 
It's getting a little dry now. I got my adrenaline's kicking in. You okay, Mark? Yeah, I'm alright, I think. Uh, alright. Jeez, it's all so hot out all of a sudden. Alright. I think I'm good to continue on. Alright. Oh, you. Bulldog. Oh, all right, see that stinger site? Got a little bit of a acute swelling, maybe some residual bumps, and it definitely burns. I would say the initial onset of the sting, it was like a lightning bolt, way more intense than a bullet ant. But, and I can tell you, it's already starting to subside a bit. But, wow, that is a rip shot of pain. Man. <clears throat> <clears throat> Really getting dry mouth, guys. The uh, is your EpiPen in your backpack? It, it is. I've got my EpiPen. Don't worry. Okay. Yeah, I don't. I don't need it yet, but got to monitor my, make sure my tongue's not swelling up or anything. But holy cow, that sting is like a hammer. It's like somebody literally just took a hammer and went wham. Instantaneous pain. Not even a small delay. As soon as the stinger touched my skin, boom, it was on. Oh, I hope you enjoyed that one because I don't think I want to go arm to stinger again with that intimidating little ant. Now I am not out of the woods by any means. I'm going to continue to monitor this thing over the next two days. I can tell you this, a single sting from a bulldog ant so far does not compete with the bullet ant. Unlike the bullet ant that just started to build and build and build, I'm starting to really get past that initial wave of pain. And now I'm just really more dealing with the, uh, the after effects of adrenaline, starting to get that like queasy stomach, cold sweat, and just simple nausea that I usually get after taking a sting. But a swarm of bulldog ants, I would estimate could take even the most pain tolerant person to their knees. All right, I think I'm gonna need some ice. Ugh. Sure enough, things got a lot worse. Just hours later, the redness and inflammation flared up and were joined by an intense itching that lasted for several days. Compared to other stings I've taken, this one was a sleeper that turned into a monster. Bulldog ant stings are known for their instant pain, so I was shocked when I was hit with these delayed reactions. While I did not experience the 24 hours of deep bone break pain that the bullet ant gave me. Ah! Oh, oh, that hurts. Ah! Ooh, oh! That is searing pain. This was far from an ordinary walk in the park. In fact, as of the editing of this video, my arm is still discolored and healing. If I were to have been swarm and stung like the stick in the beginning of the video, it would have been a very bad situation. But now I know exactly why Australians go so far out of their way to avoid the jumping tear that is the bulldog ant. Yikes. Right now, I am out tide pulling in Eastern Australia in search of the deadliest creature on the planet. The blue ring octopus has one of the most toxic venoms on earth. And if we're lucky enough to find one, I'm going to attempt to touch it with my bare hands. But first things first, let's get looking. From experience tide pooling, the best results are usually from the edge. The further out you can go, the better. An octopus can change the texture of its skin and it would just look like any of these. Now I've struck out on all three previous occasions trying to locate a blue ring octopus. I'm hoping fourth time's a charm. The difference this time is I'm searching with my good friend Miller Wilson who has seen blue rings in these tide pools before. It's very hard to pick a octopus that's a master of camouflage out from this environment. It's about to be low tide, and this is probably one of the most dangerous tide pools that I have ever searched. So wearing some nice protective shoes, gloves. I don't really want to handle the octopus, but the gloves should protect me just in case. And of course, we still need to watch our steps because if you look at this, all these rocks out here, exactly like a stonefish. And this is stonefish territory. The stonefish is the world's most venomous fish. If you step on one, your boots will not protect you. A single sting from a stonefish can be excruciating and can even be deadly. 
No octopus. Flipping's not really doing it. So I'm just gonna cruise to cover a lot of ground, looking for movement. A lot of times I do see octopus moving from pocket to pocket, but they slink along the surface. So I'm just looking for any movement right now. Any movement, we're getting it though, feel it. Oh my God, I got an octopus. I got a blue ring, guys. It's right here. There it is. I missed it. It's right in here. It's right here. How could I miss that? That was it. Got it. Oh my gosh. We got one. Are you kidding me? Yes. Boom, baby. Boom. Yes! Holy cow. Miller, we're good. We got one. Can you help me get out of the net? So you'll see I'm wearing gloves, guys, for a reason right now. This is, this is a really good way to get a nip. That is not what I want. Put that guy in there. Hello. Hey, guy. hey, buddy. Let's talk about what we found. Right there in my hand, is the most dangerous animal on the planet, at least when it comes to venom. Nothing in the animal kingdom is more toxic than this tiny little octopus. And yes, I am nervous about it, but before the end of this video, I will officially touch with my bare hand the most dangerous and toxic creature on Earth. There are actually four described varieties of blue ring octopus. This one, is the blue lined octopus. It's the only one in the family that has these really cool, vivid blue pinstripes surrounding the body. It's almost like blue tiger stripes. So if this animal is at all threatened here, I wanna show you what it does. See that? Look at those rings go. Is that cool or what? Oh, 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 okay. Stay down, stay down. If the octopus is at all agitated, not only does it flare up the rings on its arms, but those lines on its body glow. <laughs> Back up, I'm toxic. That's your abosomatic warning. And if you don't listen to me, I'm gonna give you a nip. And they show these vivid display warnings, not only for predators, but they also do it while they're hunting. They will do it to confuse or startle their would-be prey. This is what our octopus friend here is out hunting. This is a type of shore crab, but this would be the perfect food for the octopus. All right, we're gonna let this crab go. A single bite from this octopus could kill over 20 human beings. And needless to say, if I get nipped by this creature, that'll be the last nip I ever take. Now these octopus are nocturnal and they are masters of camouflage. Its normal color pattern perfectly blends in to this silty environment. They have three hearts that pump blue blood. They also have nine brains. One central brain to run the entire nervous system, but then at the base of each arm, they have another brain. And you can see there that little beak holds two venom sacs. And it's actually a toxin that it doesn't even produce itself. And it actually picks up through bacteria that it finds in the environment through other organisms in this tide pool, and it collects this bacteria in its saliva glands, and when it uses its beak to bite into its prey or a predator for escape, it will actually inject saliva into the wound. Once this saliva enters the bloodstream, you get infected with TTX. No animal has as lethal of a dose as the blue ring octopus does. If you get even a micro amount of TTX in your bloodstream, all you can do is be put on life support and hope that eventually your body works through the toxin on its own. And here's the worst part about it. While you might be in complete paralysis, you are lucid. There are survivors that have lived to tell the tale of having people try to resuscitate them, giving active CPR, and they weren't able to communicate, but they remember everything. And a lot of people get bitten by these octopus 
because of mistaken identity. You'll come out to a local beach in Tideful. Guys, turn your cameras right now. This is an active beach. People take their dogs and kids and play on this beach and these animals live all along the coastline. Now that's not to scare you. Obviously we're out here actively looking for them. They're hard to find, but people do unfortunately come into contact with these octopus and they will pick them up, play with them, and in that process take a bite, which is completely painless by the way. Initial symptoms are going to be things like tingling, difficulty breathing, difficulty thinking, loss of your motor skills, wobbly walking. If you think you are ever bitten by a blue ring octopus and you start to have symptoms, you have to be rushed to the hospital as fast as you can. We're talking like life flight situation because you only have a matter of minutes before your whole nervous system starts to shut down and you're no longer able to breathe. And saying all that, while holding the octopus in your hand, it's hard to remember the last time I was this nervous in the presence of an animal. All right, the time has come for something that I've thought a lot about. Because I know the only way that this octopus has the ability to envenomate you is a bite with its beak, I'm going to attempt to touch with my bare hand the most lethal, toxic animal on the planet. In order to do that, I'm gonna just dump out this water. Look at that. The octopus is trying to mimic the color of the cube. Rest assured, this is just a camouflage tactic. They are masters at this. That octopus is still very much able to pounce and bite. They can spend extended periods out of water. All right, so just so you guys know, uh, if this blue ring does snare me, we're going to the hospital on three. One, two, three. Oh. That made me nervous. All right, lid back on. I don't think I was just bitten now, but I'm, I'm not completely sure. I had to take a break guys because like I'm definitely feeling a little lightheaded like major anxiety that animal right there if you get bit it's game over it's lights out <sighs> guys I'm like shaking right now like my feet are tingling things that you normally wouldn't pick up on like heart rate how I'm breathing tingle feeling I got just from like all the adrenaline pumping through my body um, and the the emotions are intense, super intense. Whew, gotta shake that off. The anxiety that I'm experiencing on camera is real, as I had almost identical symptoms to that of a blue ring bite. While I was 99% sure I wasn't bitten, we had to closely monitor my symptoms until we deemed it safe enough to continue filming. The symptoms of these bites can be subtle and can be hard to differentiate from anxiety and panic from other sources of stress. Please, Never attempt to do what you are seeing in this video. I cannot stress enough, if you are bitten by a blue ring octopus, you must seek medical attention immediately. I think I'm all right. I think I'm okay to continue. Let's keep going. Okay. I, it's been a while since I've had this kind of reaction to being in an encounter with an animal. Like it's like my first time seeing a venomous snake. It's like whew, all kinds of emotions right now. Just brushing up against one in the tide pool while you're walking around, if you accidentally touch one, you're gonna be just fine. It's like every other octopus. The difference only occurs when you take a bite from the beak right there. Right now we are in the outback of Western Australia looking for a creature you truly have to see to believe. The thorny devil is like a living sculpture and some rumors say it is so sharp it can actually draw blood when you try to catch it. So if we're lucky enough, we're gonna put those rumors to the test. Let's get searching. They live exclusively on a diet of ants. Because of that need, if you find an ant mound or an ant line, there's a good chance there's a thorny devil somewhere in the vicinity so we can then create a perimeter and start really scanning the area. These are masters of camouflage in this environment, so you really need to narrow it down to a sweet spot. So sharp. Ah. This is definitely thorny devil habitat. Everything out here is spiky. Especially this plant right here. This is like little razor blade leaves. Gonna keep an eye out for that one as we search for this creature. Here we go. This is a good indication. You see that line in the sand right there? 
that's an ant track. You can actually see a few tiny, tiny ants making their way back to their nest. But this is great, guys. We've got the sandy environment. We found the food. Now it's time to find the devil itself. What I'm looking for now are either foot tracks or the outline. It has a very distinct contrast with the rest of the environment, the outline of the tail and the horns on the front. And that's what I'm gonna be scanning for along the ridges and along the bush lines. Luckily, the thorny devil is not very fast. If you can see why you have to be such a specialized animal to call this your home. Humans would not do very well living out here. Oh, I see one. Got one, we got a devil. Oh, oh. yes, yes, we got one. Oh man, this is the coolest lizard on the planet, guys. Oh my gosh, I am so excited right now. I cannot believe we found a thorny devil. Look at how cool this little dragon is. This is one of the top targets out here. And unlike their cousins in America and Mexico, the horn lizards, these guys are actually super spiky. And you see it puffing up its body and pushing those spines out. That is one of its defense mechanisms. And I could tell you that if you were to grab onto this thorny devil without knowing that it was sharp, you would get a handful of spikes. Look at how cryptic the color patterning is. This animal is superior at camouflage in this environment from the sand that's demonstrated in its arms to the foliage and the yellow leaf litter. This animal is perfectly designed for this habitat. And you can see that I'm not really doing much to keep the animal here with us. They're very docile and slow moving. In fact, they use their tail as a balance to step forward. They're almost like a chameleon and they'll do very cautious steps. So look at that, just in a matter of minutes from presenting this animal, it's already changed its color to a much more vibrant yellow on the back. And that's probably because the sun is really starting to come out today. And like most lizards, it is ectothermic. The more heat it absorbs in its body, the more energy it's going to have. And it certainly has earned its name, the thorny devil. It is extraordinarily sharp and spiny. And it is covered from the tip, tip of its tail, all the way to its fingers and sharp spikes. Andrew, stick your finger out there. Tell me what that's like. Wow, it's like, it's like prickers. It's literally as sharp as the thorns on a rose. Just because it has these defense mechanisms doesn't mean that this lizard doesn't have any predators. There are animals out here that would make a meal out of a thorny devil, including species of hawks, and of course, the predatory goannas, the giant monitors that live in this country. So that's where this animal will rely on its superior camouflage to blend into its environment, to not give its location away. It also has another unique defense mechanism. You see those two horns right at the neck? That is a false head. And in a defense situation, the thorny devil will tuck in its head, offer up that false head to any would-be predator so it has a chance to escape if attacked. So let's see if we can actually get it to do that. Offering that false head up. That is a great display. All right, let's pick it back up. Gosh, those spikes are sharp. Ah, oh, do you see him right there trying to horn me? Ah, okay, okay, okay. Let's calm down. Let's calm down. I thought we had an agreement. We we're gonna do this scene and I was gonna put you back trying to show everybody how cool you are. There we go. If you ever wanna see one in person, you have to come here to one of its native ranges. Right now we are in Western Australia, but the range extends all the way to the center of the continent. But it lives in this specialized desert terrain, feeding on ants of a particular variety. Now when I say feeding on ants, I should say feasting on ants. This little lizard has the ability to eat up to 3,000 ants a day. It will eat up to 1,000 ants in a single meal. And because of that, it actually is said that they are super intelligent. They have the ability to track through their environment to locate different colonies of ants, and they make sure that they don't overpredate any specific colony. They wanna be able to come back to the food line 
to get another meal when they need it. These animals all have a very unique color pattern. You see underneath there? The patterning on the belly is like an individualized fingerprint for these lizards. So scientists will actually take photographs of the underside of a thorny devil so they can study the populations in any given area. And this one is super cool. It's very reticulated, almost like tiger stripes. Ah, so sharp. Ah, hang on, hang on, hang on. Ah, in addition to being super spiky, it has another very unique mechanism that has developed for life out here in the desert. And that's the ability to drink using its feet. Now I've heard that if you actually pour water out and place a thorny devil in a small puddle, you can witness this happening. So we are going to try to demonstrate that for you right now. I've got a little water here. All right, let's see. Look at that. See all that moisture? Definitely have water coming up the back. I can see it on the neck. It's probably hydrating its eyes. And if we stay here long enough, it would actually be able to siphon some of that water into its mouth. But that is so cool. So those scales are adapted to be able to suck up moisture from the ground to keep this lizard hydrated. It's hard to believe, even holding it here in my hand, seeing it move, seeing it look at me, I'm almost in disbelief that this is even a real living thing. And for those of you who've been watching to see if the thorny devil is indeed sharp enough to draw blood, well, here you go. I mean, it is, it is spiky. It's like holding the thorns of a rose. So I'm gonna do this delicately. Ready? Ah, you're spining me. Ah, yep, ah, it's wriggling around and it's so spiky, but ah, I think the verdict is in. I do not think the thorny devil is sharp enough to draw blood, even though, ah, ow, he's spiky. Definitely does not feel good when it tenses up those spines, ow. From its defense mechanisms and the spines and the false head to even the way that it drinks, how cool was it to come across the real dragon of the outback, the thorny devil. Lizard, lizard, right here. You guys rolling? Whoa, check that out. Look at that. This is a shingleback. Wow, what an amazingly cool lizard this is. Let me see if I can pick it up carefully. Oh, don't wanna get bit. Don't wanna get bit by this guy, hang on. Look at that defensive display. Oh, got a lunge. Oh, he is, he is a feisty one. Oh, oh, do you hear that? Hear that hiss? Got him. All right. Here, let's come on in close, guys. That, that is a really good look at their defensive display. I was hoping we would come across one of these lizards here in Western Australia. And there it is, our first reptile of the trip, the shingleback. The first thing you notice about this animal is that tongue sticking out, flaring its tongue out saying, hey, I'm feisty and I will give you a tremendous bite if you get any closer. You can see the size of those mandibles and it does have razor sharp teeth. Let's talk about its name. The shingleback gets its name because of its armored plating. Look at those scales. They are raised up and very thick like an armored little tank. Here, Andrew, like, put your, feel the back of that. Whoa, he's super tough. He's super tough. An extra tough lizard that utilizes its scales to ward off predators. Those armored scales would act like a plate, a barrier, to hopefully protect it long enough to scurry away. Now, some people would call this a shingleback. Others would know it as a bobtail. It gets the name bobtail because of this little nubby tail on the back, which, has a couple of purposes. The first purpose is it's a defense mechanism because it's a false head. So if there's a predator like a hawk or a snake that comes in and tries to eat this lizard, it might accidentally go for the wrong side because it looks a lot like its head. And that would be good for this lizard because it would give it a chance to get away. Now, another purpose for that bobtail is it's a fat store. 
being out here in the desert, water is scarce and energy can be scarce. So certain times of the season, while this lizard can be hibernating, it relies on the fat stores in its tail to survive. Now these lizards are a species of blue tongue skink. And while their tongue isn't as bright as their cousin, the Eastern blue tongue, I think their armored appearance makes them the coolest of these spunky Australian lizards. I wanna be very clear, I do not wanna take a bite from this lizard. It has very strong jaws because it is an omnivore. It feasts on a diet of snails and beetles, so it requires strong mandibles to crush those shells up. And I don't want you to crush my finger, right? Because we're gonna be friends, because I'm gonna help you out too before the end of this video. These lizards can be found while road cruising out here in the outback. They are often victims of car strikes because they like to stay on the road to get warmth. They are ectothermic, so we're gonna help you Cross the road, buddy, don't worry. But we're also gonna help you out with something else. Now, one of the things that we can do is to remove some of its parasites. You see that right there? Let's get a tight shot. These reptiles are known to be covered in ticks. So anytime we encounter an animal with visible parasites like leeches, barnacles, or ticks, we always do our best to try to remove them if possible. In this case, removing these pesky bloodsuckers will cause no pain to the lizard and will certainly help its chances for survival in this harsh desert environment. This is a little bit risky right here. Getting my fingers super close to those jaws. Got him. Oh, oh no. There's more. Ugh. Hang on, buddy. We'll help you out here. Oh, guys, there are so many ticks on this lizard. That one was in its left ear, and the ticks do like to go for the softer part, so ears and in between the scales. I'm gonna try to try this one out. There we go, yeah. Gotcha. There we go, and there is another tick. See, that's what friends do. We remove ticks from each other's ears. You would do the same for me, wouldn't you? Now this is not a tick that would burrow into a human, but they can actually get about 20 times this size by engorging themselves with the blood of these reptiles. I've actually found a tick on another shingleback before that was the size of a grape. Ugh, disgusting, right? Ugh, we don't want ticks. I think I got the main ticks off of you. Got him. Got him. They are all stuffed in his ear. How did you get so many ticks inside your ear? Oh gosh, guys. There are so many ticks in this lizard's ear. You guys are gonna wanna get a shot of this, it's close. Ugh, look at that. Dude, where have you been? All right, no more ticks. I think I got them all out of that ear. I'm sure that feels a lot better, huh, buddy? Now you can hear again. All right, the sun's coming back out. He's getting a little feisty. Uh, let's see if we can get another look at that iconic defense display, that tongue bleh, splaying out to warn any predator off. All right, I'm gonna try to put him down carefully, and not take a bite. Ready, you guys got your shot? One, two, three. See that, see that, see that dispense display? Oh, Whew. he is fast. Yeah, yeah. Hey, we're still friends, don't worry. Oh. Looks angry. oh man, they are feisty when they want to be. Oh, not messing around, are you buddy? Ah, too close. Gosh, he bit down hard. Oh, guys. Look at that bite. We we're trying to get the thumbnail and I was using my hat to shade and he's totally bit my hat. Oh my gosh, it is strong. I don't think it's gonna let go. You would not want to take a bite from this lizard. Holy smokes, it is just bulldog grip. Let's see if I can just put it down if it'll let go. Give me my hat. Who do you think you are, Jake Paul? Got my hat? Can I have my hat back, sir? Please? Are you kidding me? Thank you. Thank you for my hat back. Okay. Wow. You would not want to take a bite from this lizard. It is a bulldog. That is a bite that you would not soon forget. So cool. 
All right. It is a beautiful day in New Zealand. We're here filming a couple projects, and I wasn't gonna come to New Zealand without doing one of the things that I've always wanted to do. That's right. Today, we're going Zorbing. So what is Zorbing, you might ask? Well, it appears pretty simple. Essentially, they stuff us into one of these inflatable balls, and then they roll us down a mountainside. What could go wrong? Mario, you wanna do this too? I will not be Zorbing because I get a little motion sick and I don't want to add any liquids to the water that's already in there. Good luck, dude. Let's do it. See ya. First things first, we gotta get to the top of the hill. Let's go. I'm gonna be walking up this hill three times today because there are three courses. There's the fast track, which just goes straight down the hill. There's the zigzag, which as you can tell by the name, zigs and zags. And then the last course, Course number three is called the drop. Now I haven't seen this course, but I can kind of tell by the name. It includes some kind of free fall. And I figured that sounds like it's worth saving for last. So anyway, I'm at the top. I see the, uh, the Zorbs are about ready. And I'm about to get in and try my hand at one of New Zealand's favorite activities, Zorbing. All right, I figured I'd do a little bit of uh, some play-by-play -play action. We got Mark up there. He's not in the ball yet. We've been waiting patiently. I'm anxious. I'm a bit nervous. I hope he accomplishes his dream. I'm just talking to the camera. Just talking to myself as usual. All right, this might be the moment. We've been here for over an hour. He's not in the ball yet. I think he's getting cold feet. I believe in you, Mark. You can do it. Get in that ball, bro. Get in that ball and roll down. All right, how's it going? I'm Mark. I'm Esther, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. So you're going to be the one controlling the ride today. I'm going to be the one kicking you down the hill, yep. Do you, do you literally just I stomp just, me down? Sometimes I do that, okay. but um, I might have to push you because you're a little bit heavier. I'm a little bit heavier. Well, I did have a big breakfast this morning. I hope that's what you mean. <laughs> but. Why don't we go through the protocol here, like explain to us what is Zorbing and what's the goal of the experience? So if you ever wonder what it's like to be inside a washing machine. I do wonder that. Well, here it is. Am I going to be clean when I get to the bottom? Surely, yeah. Sometimes we can put um, soap in there so you get all nice and squeaky clean. Oh. Yep. I think it's probably time that I get yeah. shoved inside this ball and you kick <laughs> me down the mountain. Yep. All right, cool. Yeah. High five. Nice. So here's what's going to happen, guys. I'm about to dive into that hole, into this giant inflatable ball. It's not gonna pop, right? Uh, How often have you had them well, pop? No, we haven't had any pop yet, but I always do a scope of the tracks every morning to make okay. sure there's nothing on there to puncture them. Did you pull. scope it well today? I did. I scoped it very well just for you. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, <laughs> here we go. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go ahead and dive in. So here we go, guys. This is my first time getting into Zorb and getting kicked off a mountainside. And yeah, here we go. I'm in. It's a lot of big echo in here. Can you hear that? Yeah. I kind of figured it would be a little claustrophobic, but yeah, there's a lot of room in here, a lot of headspace. This just got real. I'm about to go down the mountainside in this giant inflatable ball room thing. So I think I'm ready. Let's do it. Let's go Zorbing. I'm ready. Let's do it. Here we go. Oh. Oh man, I could hear him scream. I don't know if that screams of joy or fear, but he's rolling. He is rolling. Whoa. Oh buddy. That? This is probably the coolest thing I've ever done. Is that that a, is insane. Dream for you? You need to do this. I don't know about that. You need to do this. This, this is super cool. Intense. Dude, it's very intense. You're it's right. way more intense than it looks. Oh, 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 you're supposed oh. Dude, you're like a little baby, you just were born. Welcome I absorbed, and now I am born. I'm born in the New Zealand way, the most epic fashion possible. I just went Zorbing, and it was amazing. 
Oh. I'm ready to do it again. That was round one. Now we're gonna go back to the top for course number two, the zigzag. Here we go. Woo. Yes. Mark just finished the first set of orbing. He came out a new man. He was all wet, steamy. I call it the orb of life. It's like a womb and inside is water that's actually nutrients and it gives it sustenance. So Mark is going for round two. Pretty cold up here. I just did my first Zorb run. It was incredible. Now I'm doing run number two. Let's get in the Zorb and go for the zigzag. Here we go. Ready? Bye. Oh, here we go. Woo! Oh boy. Whoa! Is out. Oh, oh, just like a little baby. What's up, buddy? Definitely get a little motion sick after that one. That one was way, way crazier. Hitting those edges of the zigzag is just like, whoosh, and just like flip you around. For a minute there, I was just like straight going backwards. I couldn't see where I was going. That was pretty disorienting. Whew. One more run so I can complete the tracks and get the full absorbing experience. One more run means one more run up the hill. Here we go. And he's off in his wet socks. There it is. Final Zorb. I've got one more run to go. And this one is the most epic of all. It's called the drop. Can't even see the track, so I have no idea how big the drop is, but I've heard that uh, people get completely suspended in air to the middle of the Zorb. So should be pretty cool. Wish me luck, guys. Two runs down, one to go. Hopefully I make it and also get to keep my breakfast. Again. I'm free. 
<laughs> was the third time the charm? That was no? ridiculous, guys. That one was crazy. Woo! All right, guys. Well, that about does it. We had the full Zorbean experience today here at Zorb New Zealand. Even broke the tripod on the last run. In total, we did three runs. They were all amazing, and I highly recommend you come check out Zorbean if you ever make it to New Zealand. Over the years, Brave Wilderness has shown you some pretty strange oddities of the animal world. We've seen tiny anteaters, worms that bite, worms that aren't even worms at all, how about those giant salamanders? And we've even shown you frogs with transparent skin. But the one I'm going to show you today is both bizarre in appearance and has one of the weirdest traits I've ever heard of. Or should I say smelled of? Get your popcorn ready. This one is unbelievable. What's going on everybody? I'm Mark Vins and welcome back for another adventure here at the Wildlife HQ in Sunshine Coast, Australia. And we're here again today with Sue. And Sue, I see you have some bananas that we're going to use to feature our next guest. Yes, this is his favorite food. But most people have probably never heard of his species before. Okay, and what is his species? So they're known as a binturong, um, or their common name is a bear cat, but Ooh. they're not a bear and they're not a cat. Okay, cool. I like the name bear cat. That's already piqued my interest right there. I'm gonna use a GoPro to try to see how close I can actually get, but you feel good about this? Yes, let's go. Okay, let's go find a bear cat. <laughs> To encounter a bear cat in the wild is extremely rare, as they have become vulnerable and even endangered in much of their natural range in Southeast Asia. This is unfortunately due to poaching and habitat loss. Looks like Sari has caught wind of the bananas. Yeah, it's looking pretty good here. He's having a big stretch. Come Are on. bear cats traditionally a nocturnal species? Mostly nocturnal, so not strictly, but mostly. Okay. This bear cat reminds me of a wolverine. And the wolverine we've worked with in Alaska was not nearly this calm. So I'm hoping that Sari stays in this demeanor for the entirety of this episode. He's actually a gentle giant. Okay, good. They definitely look a little bit intimidating, I will say. Look at those claws. Check out that big tail. His tail is actually fully prehensile and he can suspend his whole weight by the very tip of his tail. Hey, sorry. Hi. Look at that. Yum. Yum. Oh, yeah. How's that? That's just how, ooh. Ugh. That's how I eat a banana. You are slobbering all over me. But thank you for coming down to hang out. You are very interesting. Oh, look at that claw. Look at, what's another bite? Oh, my goodness. So, I'm able to get a good look at these claws, and they are razor sharp, no doubt, for climbing trees but the pads are almost like a bear. I can definitely see why they get the name Bearcat. Not only are they absolutely covered in this fluffy mane, but also their claws and pads are just like a black bear. Look at you, hi, how's it going? And you can see the, the cat comes from the whiskers. So to clear things up, let's talk about this name Bearcat. While possessing bear-like feet and cat-like whiskers, a binturong is not related to a bear or a cat. In fact, its family, Viveridae, contains many other unusual small to medium-sized mammals, like the civet. But this omnivorous bear cat is the largest, and although it looks an awful lot like a wolverine or a badger, it's not closely related to them either. Now, how old will a bear cat live? Uh, so up to about 25 years. Okay, and how old is, sorry if you don't uh, mind me asking, is that rude? Is that rude? Sorry. <laughs> I'm sure he doesn't mind. Uh, he's about 11 years old. Okay, so the, the coloration, whoa, 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 see, we got a little bit more left. Oh my <laughs> gosh. So the, the coloration in the fur, that has nothing to do with age? It doesn't, no. And they can vary in color depending on what region they're found. Uh, so they can be really gray right through to the black. Very cool. Now, while the hair does keep the bear cat warm, it also doubles as a natural raincoat, keeping the saboreal species dry up in the treetops. All right, we've got one last little piece, sorry. This is gonna be it, this is the outro, you ready? Well, I hope you guys enjoyed hanging out with this bear cat as much as I did today. Thank you, Sue, so much. If you guys are ever in the Sunshine Coast of Australia, say hello to our friend, the bear cat, sorry. You won't be disappointed. I'm Mark Vins, be brave, stay wild, We'll see you on the next adventure. All right, see you, sorry. 
Hey, just quiet, real quick. Hey, guys. Uh, we're about to leave, and then I saw this. That's not rain. It's me. And it smells just like popcorn. Oh my gosh. It's like all around us. <laughs> I cannot believe that. If you told me, hey, somebody's got a fresh bag of popcorn ready, I would believe you right now. Holy smokes. All right, banana drop, I'm out. <laughs> Never in my wildest dreams did I ever imagine feeding a bear cat. And who knew they liked bananas so much? But boy, the shocker of the century had to be this animal's unique and oddly familiar scent. While bear cats always smell subtly like corn chips because of their musk, their pee smells just like buttered popcorn. Not kind of like it, or somewhat like it. We're talking exactly like it. And this is due to the chemical compound in their urine known as 2-acetyl-1-pyrrolene, which is the same chemical compound created in the popcorn popping process when sugars and amino acids interact at high temperatures. Honestly, before today, if you were to tell me any animal's urine would smell exactly like my favorite snack food, my answer would be no way. But it does. Let's just say going to the movies will never be the same. Huge thanks goes out to Australia's Wildlife HQ. We love the HQ because they are a small family-owned wildlife park run by passionate conservationists who aid in important efforts, including the Queensland Koala Crusaders, a group in particular need at the moment as a result from the fires. Their support for conserving wildlife means that by paying a visit, you can both have the rare opportunity to get up close with some incredible creatures and conserve them all at the same time. And let me know if you do stop by by tagging me on Instagram at RealMarkVince. I do respond to comments and would love to hear from you directly. <laughs>